to Pastor Bean, our committed assistant pastor, Minister Burns, to all other ministers of the gospel and to all of you in your respective places. Again, I say good morning. We would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and welcome some special people that might be in the house this morning. If we have any guests in the house, we ask that you please stand and you may share any other information that you would like at this time. All guests, please. On behalf of the Friendship family, we welcome you here this morning. Not just this morning, anytime you feel the need, please stop by and see us. For this is the church where everybody is somebody and Jesus Christ is Lord. morning. I'll be reading from the King James Version, Psalm 16, entire chapter, verses 1 through 11. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. My, o my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord. My goodness extend not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, to the excellent in whom is my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offering of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lip. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly inheritance. I will bless the Lord whom has given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night season. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoice. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. God's word for God's people. Amen. You thought I was worth saving. You came and changed.
us pray. Gracious Lord, our Father, thank you, dear God, for looking beyond my faults, supplying me with my needs, and thank you for allowing me to stand one more time and to proclaim your word. So, Father, I ask that you allow Ken to sit while you stand put the cross, put me behind your cross, O God, that I may see what thus says the Lord, that your people will have listening ears and receiving hearts, O God, that your word may touch them in a way that will have them come running to you asking, what must I do to be saved? So, Father, I ask now that the words of my mouth be in the meditation of my heart, be acceptable to you, O God, because you are my strength and my redeemer. It's in your son Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Good morning to Pastor Bing and to Pastor Gavin and his wife and to Reverend Faust and Reverend Griffin and Reverend Thomas, to the deacons and deaconesses and to members and friends alike, to my wife and all of you here to the gospel here to hear the gospel this morning I say to you again good morning it's a good day God woke us up this morning it's already a good day so without further delay I will call your attention to a familiar passage of scripture in the book of Psalms Psalm 23 at verse number four Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There is a song that says, never alone, and the lyrics goes like this. When you walk through a storm, and hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm, there's a golden sky and a sweet civil song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain. Though your dreams be tossed and blown, walk on, walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone. You'll never Walk alone, walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. For the subject this morning, I like to use never alone. Never alone. I understand that there will be periods that we will go through and we'll have uncertainties and difficult times. But I stop by today to tell you or inform you that when you are connected to Jesus, you are never alone. All right, all right. Uh, for God said in Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. In Hebrews 13, 5, echoes those same sentiments, which says, keeping your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, and I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me. As children, as a child growing up, 
there were stages of prayer for us to learn. We had to learn different prayers. As a child, we started out with, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That was a prayer that we had to learn before we went to sleep. And then we graduated, Mr. Blackshear. We, we moved up to what they're called the model of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. From there we move to learn Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. This psalm was written by a shepherd who had a deep history and deep relationship with God. In describing the Lord as a shepherd, David wrote out his own experience because he had spent his early years caring for sheep. We spent a lot of time talking about David this morning in Sunday school. If you weren't there, you missed it. A boy who was chosen by God to do what God had destined him to do. A boy who was overlooked but found special favor in the sight of God. A shepherd boy who watched the flock and protected them from the wild animals and made sure they were safe and had whatever they needed to maintain life. But before David could be recognized, he had to go through some trials of his own. First Samuel chapter 16 says, as Samuel looked for the next king, says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then sent Shammah pass. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven sons that all passed by Samuel. But they were not the chosen one. Then Samuel asked Jesse, do you have any other sons? And he said, yes, I have my youngest. But he's out doing what he does. He's out watching the sheep. He was a shepherd boy. But John 10 says, a New Testament talks about Jesus as being a shepherd. But they talk about Jesus as the good shepherd. John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hands is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. He had no relationship, in other words. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen, but I must bring them along also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Hebrews 13, 20 describes him as the great shepherd. It says, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. And 1 Peter 5 describes him as the chief shepherd. It says, and when the chief shepherd appears, 
you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. The Lord is my shepherd, which makes us his sheep. Not frightened passive animals, but obedient followers, wise enough to follow one who will lead us in the right places and right ways. This psalm does not focus on the animal-like qualities of a sheep, but rather on the discipleship qualities of those who follow him. When you recognize the good shepherd, give you some advice, follow him. When we allow God to be our shepherd or to guide us, we have contentment. When we choose to sin, however, we go our own way and cannot blame God for the environment that we created for ourselves. The book of Psalms is full of encouraging words, of which David wrote at least 73 of these Psalms. David cried out or lamented to the Lord for everything. He was not afraid to let the Lord know how he felt. And he also knew that the Lord would respond to his prayer. It's one thing to pray, but it's another thing when you get a response. And if you took on David, you had to know you were also taking on the Lord. Because David, if you went to David, David's going to go to the Lord and Say, get him. Take care of my enemies, Lord. But David would also dance and praise God for the things that he would do on his behalf. So he had good reason to praise him. We don't do enough of that. We don't praise God enough. We only want to praise God when for the big things in life. But just the mere fact that you woke up this morning. You should have been praising. Amen. The mere fact that you can see today, somebody lost their glasses, so obviously they got some eye problems. But for the mere fact that you can see, you ought to praise him. Yeah, yeah. For the mere fact that you were able to walk up the stairs, you ought to praise God. For the mere fact that you have food in your refrigerator, you ought to praise him. Amen. For the mere fact that you're not homeless on the street and have food to eat and clothes to put on your back, you ought to be <laughs> praising God. Praise him in the morning. Praise him at night. That everything that has breath should be praising the Lord. But here we have a young man that would become king. Who would celebrate and be celebrated for his achievements on the battlefield. The slaying of a giant named Goliath who he killed with the sling and a rock. A man who was described as a person after God's own heart. But also a person not free of sin and conflict. In writing this psalm, there were three very comfortable premises recognized by David. In this psalm, he draws three very comfortable conclusions. And teaches and encourages us to do so too. First, he talks about his relationship or we should talk about our relationship to God as our shepherd. Second, he recounts his experience of the kind of things God had done for him as his shepherd. We all have a testimony. So David was talking about his te- giving his testimony. And third, he infers that he should not want any good thing and that he needed to fear no evil because we are saved by hope. And that hope will not make us unashamed because it is well grounded. It is the duty of us as Christians to encourage ourselves in the Lord. And we are here directed to take and encourage both in our relationship with him and with others. Uh, This psalm has only six verses, but six are the most encouraging and powerful verses in the Bible. So just for a few minutes, let us look at these words of encouragement. Now, I don't know where David was and when he decided to pin these words or what frame of mind that he may have been in. But if you allow me just for a few minutes to use my Christian 
imagination. I like to tell a story. My way. I can see David maybe somewhere in his home or sitting under a tree, scratching his head with a tablet on his lap, thinking about or reminiscing about all the things that God had done for him. And then, just as he got this thought, started to speak and acknowledge God, as he always had done. So he begins with this verse. The Lord is my shepherd. Describing God as his shepherd. And because he was his shepherd, David says, I shall not want. Which speaks to the power and resources. Paul says in Philippians 4, 19 and 20, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. In, in other words, God was all he needed. And for me, I, I could have stopped at the Lord is, Dick. Because the Lord is my hope. He's my joy. He's my peace. He's my strength. He's my courage. He's my love. He's my bright morning star. He is my beginning and he is my end. He's my song. He's my salvation. The Lord is everything we need. And, and, and once David thought about that for a while, he goes on and, and, and says, because he is my shepherd, I shall not want. But then he does something else for me. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now, not just any pasture, but green pastures, which symbolizes life and growth. And then he says something important. He leads me, which means we must be willing to follow. But where he's leading, besides still waters, which speaks to a calmness or a peace that we need to have, that God can provide for us. Remember him, Jesus taking a trip on the sea with disciples? But when, and when the winds got turbulent and started to blow, the water began to take on, the ship began to take on water and rocked and swayed. The disciples were afraid and thought they were going to die. But when Jesus stepped out on the bow the, and spoke to the winds and, and said, peace, be still. Sometimes every now and then we need him to step into our lives and to give us a peace that Philippians says that transcends all understanding and will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So every now and then we ask Jesus to step in and give us some peace. But the next verse after he got the peace, he says that he restores my soul. He in the restoration business. David knew about restoration because of his encounter with Bathsheba. He cried out to the Lord in Psalm 51. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from guilt or bloodshed. You had your right to kill. Oh God, the God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Like David, sometimes we need to cry out to the Lord. We need to be restored. We sing revive us this morning, revive us again this morning. Sometimes our spirit and our body needs a revival. When people sap your energy with foolish stuff, you need to be restored. When your heart and mind wanders away, you need to be restored. When people may talk about you, 
You, you need to be restored. Sometimes you lose hope. You need to be restored. Well, we have a God that's in the restoration business that is able to do what we can't do. You say, well, how is that? How, how, how can he do that? Remember who we're talking about. We're talking about a God who spoke a world into a system. We're talking about a God who took dust and made man. We're talking about a God who took a rib and, and made a woman. We're talking about a God who parted a sea. We're talking about a God who made water come from a rock. We're talking about a God who made a donkey talk. We're talking about a God who made the blind see. We're talking about a God who made the lame walk. We're talking about a God who has power to do all things. We're talking about a God who's able to certainly restore me. He restores my soul. But our problem with all of that is that we don't have the patience to wait on it. But one of my favorite scriptures is Isaiah 40, which reminds us what we need to do when it comes to patience. He said he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Talking about restoration. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So David knew something about God. He knew what God was capable of. But he also had patience enough to wait on him. But then he says this verse. Yea, though I walk through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. David understood that there were going to be some valleys. We're going to go through some valley. But also David knew that he wasn't going to get stuck there. He wasn't going to be in a bad spot forever or stay there because God was everything to him and for him. There are going to be storms that occur in our lives, but you have God. There are going to be situations and circumstances, but you have God. And when you have God with you, you have nothing to fear. Second right. Timothy said, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound, man, sound mind. Understand we are going to go through some things. But as the hymnist wrote, I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days and some lonely nights. But when I look around and I think things over, all of my good days outweigh my bad days. And I won't complain. It is comforting knowing that you have someone with you to help you in your time of need. No better example than the three Hebrew boys. They are prime examples of what we're talking about here this morning. In the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down to a gold image. So they had to deal with King Nebuchadnezzar. And they said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, angry, and expression of his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound 
in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and uh, their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fire furnace. Then they say, therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace. Amen. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar yeah, yeah, yeah. was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men into the midst of the fire? We put three, we put three in there, didn't we? They answered and said to the king, true old king, we, we put three in there. But he said, look, I, I see four men, loose, not bound anymore, loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. So in the midst of your circumstance, you need to know, no matter how you walk, that you never walk alone. So we close this out with five and six. David says how highly he magnifies God's graciousness. Thou prepareth a table before me. Thou hast provided for me all things pertaining to both life and godliness. In other words, he's saying that God prepared, had food for him convened at the table. A cup filled, meat for his hunger, drink for his thirst, that he had carefully and readily provided for him. His table was not spread with anything that came next to hand, but prepared before him. But he had abundance because he said, my cup runneth over. That means he had enough for me and my friends. But then he says this, thou anoints my head with oil. Samuel anointed him king, which was a certain pledge, but this was rather an instance of plenty with which God had blessed him or an allusion to the extraordinary entertainment of special friends whose head they anointed with oil, Luke 7, 46. Then finally, he says, surely, 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 that's reassurance. I like this. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. I don't know about you. It's going to follow me all the days. That's a long time. All the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus said in John 14, as he was going to prepare a place for me, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That's a good thing to know. But the Bible tells us in order for that to happen, Jesus had to die. And not just die, but to die a cruel death. Know that you are never alone. In your pursuit of Christ, you never walk alone. Amen. The Bible declares that he will never leave us nor forsake us. But I like what the hymnist wrote. I've seen the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder roll. I felt sin's breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. I heard the voice of my Savior. Tell me, Ken, still fight on. He promised never to leave me. 
never to leave me alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. The words, fierce winds are blowing. Temptations, sharp and keen. I hear, I have a piece of knowing. My Savior stands between. He stands to shield me from danger. When earthly things are gone, he promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. He died for me on a mountain. For me, they pierced his side. For me, he opened a fountain, the crimson cleansing tide. For me, he's waiting in glory, seated upon his throne. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. I don't know about you this morning, but I'm glad this morning that I walk with him. I walk with him. I talk with him. He tells me that I'm his own. Because one day on a hill called Calvary, he died for my sin. He died for your sin. But the Bible tells me that he got up early one morning with all power in his hand. I don't know about you, but I'm glad. Anybody in here glad this morning? Anybody know Jesus for yourself? Anybody knows that he's able to do all things and all things well? Anybody have an experience, an encounter with Jesus? Anybody in this place wants to have a relationship with Jesus? Anybody in this place know that Jesus is able to do all things? I tell you, I stopped by today to tell you that you never, you never, you never walk alone. So I get up every morning, Ms. Goldman, praising him, thanking him for the shoes on my feet, the clothes on my back, the roof over my head. I got something to shout about. I got something to praise him for. You have something to praise him for. You never, you never, you think you're doing it on your own? I got news for you, baby. Jesus does everything for you, to you, and with you. So know that you know that you know that you never, ever have to walk alone. Amen. Let us stand. Never. Never alone. Never alone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For you to understand that you're never alone, you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So as we sing, pass me not, there may be someone who would wish to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to return home and be restored. As we sing, will you come?
Good Morning Friendship. You can now give your tithes and offerings electronically through a link on the internet, a text to give number, or through a mobile app called Give Plus. Now for those who are comfortable giving in the old school way of writing a check or money order, you can still do that by sending a check payable to Friendship Baptist Church at the address listed on screen. But for those who would like to use a safe mobile app, a secure web link, or to easily send a text to give your tithes and offerings, this system is now available. For more information, please view the videos that follow or click the link below to send an offering online. In today's fast-moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones, and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then, send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Give Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer.